Today's guest is a supporting sponsor of Liberty and Finance. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest and a new guest who has never been with us before. Rick Rule is the returning guest, CEO of Rule Investment Media. Rick, thanks for coming back on. Always a pleasure, Doug, and thank you for having me back. We're also delighted to introduce Darren Hall, the president and CEO of Caliber Mining, who's joining us from Down Under. He's a day ahead of us. It always makes me feel a little self-conscious to realize I'm behind uh, folks that are ahead of us in time zones, but we're grateful for your presence here for the first time on Liberty and Finance, Darren. Yeah, thanks, Dan, again, and uh, pleasure to be here and appreciate the time. Well, we've wanted to get a chance to meet with you for some time. In fact, we've struggled for really months <laughs> to get all of our calendars aligned. I'm glad we were finally able to accomplish that. And uh, we had met with Ryan King uh, from Caliber Mining before. He introduced us an overview of the company, operations, some of the aspects of the major factors in, involved in the mining industry and so on. But we really wanted to get your perspective as the president and CEO, because uh, I understand you're very close to the operations history there and can give us a real uh, insight into that. Could you talk to us just for a moment before we plunge into more about the company, first about yourself and how it is uh, your path that you took to the president and CEO of Caliber Mining? Yeah, thanks, Dan, again. Um, I won't go too far back in history at the risk of dating myself, but I was trained as a mining engineer and had the benefit of working for Newmont for around 30 years, primarily in mine development, operating and growth focus roles in Australasia, North America, South America and Southeast Asia. Uh, towards the end of my tenure, I was accountable for operations across the Australia Pacific region with Newmont, which at the time accounted for about 40% of Newmont's global production and EBITDA. In 2015, I was approached to join New Market Gold as COO when the company purchased Fosterville and two other Australian operations from Crocodile Gold. I've, suffice to say, a very different company than what I've been familiar with, but I think that's what interested me, an opportunity to utilize my skills in an organization with the support of an investor board backed by a f formidable lineup of investors. The new market story is well understood, and I remained with Kirk and Lake through the merger, assimilating the Canadian and Australian assets as COO, and then rejoined with the founders of New Market at Calibre in late 2017. Well, we're glad to have your you're here for the first time with us. And Rick, you've talked to us several times in the past about uh, people who get lucky tend to uh, get lucky on a serial basis if they have the right. Um, the right stuff and the right attitude, the right teams that they surround themselves with and the right approach. Uh, what is it about uh, Caliber Mining and perhaps under the now at, with Darren at the helm that attracted you from a specifically from the standpoint of team and their track record? Well, two different questions, I think. Uh, Darren, as he points out, worked three decades to be an overnight success, uh, which is to say he was part of a very large organization, uh, Newmont, where... Uh, try as you are, as you might, it's tough to make a dent. Uh, and then he goes to an organization, New Market, where basically the whole success or failure of the company is up to him. <laughs> uh, uh, when you prove yourself as an entrepreneur, uh, having been backed uh, by 30 years of varied operational experience at a circumstance like uh, New Market, you have a fairly formidable range of skills. The thing that attracted me, uh, I guess, to uh, Caliber and, and disclosure of conflict, uh, I am a shareholder and have been for a fairly substantial period of time, was simply the vision of being uh, a competently run uh, mining company, but with capital markets, markets experience. The idea in Caliber from the very beginning was to grow scale as rapidly as possible, to organize the assets and administer the assets well in a business-like fashion, but to grow the company so that its market capitalization increased, so that it was in included in various indexes, and so as a consequence of its very size and scale, it could lower its cost of capital in the capital-intensive business. Uh, an acquisition that I'm sure Darren will describe to us fairly uh, quickly, or, or, or fairly soon from now, uh, is one of the steps that the company has taken in place to cause that to occur. So I, I'm attracted to it because this growth by amalgamation uh, is a business plan that has proven many times over the course of my career, buy assets, 
that have been starved by prior administrations for cash flow, show them some love and attention, make them what they can, use the luster associated with those assets to uh, acquire new assets, rinse, wash, and repeat. Now, the other thing you've talked to us about, Rick, in the past is about the fact that when you're looking at the natural resource investments, there can be like finding a needle in the haystack because there are many who <laughs> who are form companies and they seek funding and they seek investment and so on, but they don't necessarily produce and move forward and actually make progress. And here we have a company, if I understand correctly, and Darren, I'd like this is the question for you. If you could tell us about how Caliber has moved forward from being primarily an exploration focused company into actually development company like 2018, 2019, and now where you're taking the strategy next. Yeah, thanks, Dunnigan. And uh, there's not much I can really add to what uh, to Rick's already t chatted about, right? Is, is that, you know, he's kind of encapsulated it very well there in that intro. Um, you know, if we, if we think about the journey, you know, I engaged as one of the founders of what we like to call New Caliber in 2018 as a company commenced its metamorphosis from being an exploration and development focused or a, 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 an exploration and kind of uh, prospect generator to a production company. Um, the vision we established at that time, which remains today, is to establish a quality, multi-asset, multi-jurisdictional, mid-tier gold producer by generating operating cash flow to fund organic growth while seeking attractive opportunities to grow externally. You know, following our new market model, the first step in delivering that vision was to identify and acquire gold production with growth potential, which we did in 2019 with the purchase of our Nicaraguan assets from BG Gold. You know, being a part of the early evaluation process provided me insight into what were at the time non-core assets for B2 Gold. Now, B2 Gold and Clive were very supportive of the assets, but as they've been successful leveraging off the cash flow that came out of the Nicaraguan assets and then some very accretive M&A activities in the Philippines and Africa and other locations, their human and political capital or financial capital focused elsewhere. So us coming in and having a fresh set of eyes allowed the team and I to jumpstart the process of transforming them into core assets for Calibre, building off a solid legacy developed by B2 Gold. And you, and you think about the journey over the last two years, I'm extremely proud of what the team has accomplished. We've grown production and consistently de delivered on our commitments quarter over quarter. We've reinvested into near mine exploration and mine development, which has increased confidence, expanded resources and grown production ultimately resulting in a twofold, over twofold increase in reserves after production depletion. Additionally, we've re realized a significant value from the implementation of a hub and spoke operating strategy, which has, has allowed us to utilize a portion of the 2.2 million tonne per annum installed processing capacity at Libertad. It's important to note that when we purchased the assets, Libertad had been foreshadowed to go into closure in 2020 due to lack of feed all of which positions Calibre with an incredible opportunity to continue unlocking shareholder value, given our ability to self-fund exploration and growth from operating cash flow, supported by a clean balance sheet with currently $73 million in cash, no debt, and being unhedged. Rick, as a value analyst and as a credit analyst, that's something that you always help us to see because frankly, most of us don't have the skills to be able to really pull those kind of details out of a balance sheet and operating plan. What is it about the the model, this sort of this operating strategy from a financial standpoint that attracts you? Well, let's work backwards. You don't have to be much of a credit analyst to understand no debt. Um, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't challenge me too much. I get no debt. Uh, that means that there's plenty of financial flexibility in place. Uh, you, you'll never make a politician. Sorry. <laughs> And there's a reasonable amount of cash, which is to say from a financial point of view, uh, their future is in their own hands or at the very worst, theirs to screw up. Uh, it's important to revisit uh, what Darren said. The assets have become non-core to Clive. Uh, that isn't any criticism of the assets. If you buy or discover something like Facola, uh, 5 million ounce tier one deposit, it's obvious that that becomes your focus and everything else becomes distal to your focus. And that's what happened. Uh, you had uh, a perfectly competent company that moved on because they had a, a different class of asset, which allowed Darren and his team to build their company around uh, lavishing love, care, and attention uh, on an asset that, although it was in the hands of competent operators, didn't receive their full-time attention. The, 
business plans that was enunciated to me in 2018 or 2019 was always to restore the luster of Nicaragua. And then once uh, any problems in Nicaragua had been solved, to use that as a platform to acquire other assets to repeat the process while at the same time increasing the share trading activity, hence the share price, hence lowering the cost of capital to affect uh, competitive advantages against other uh, smaller competitors that didn't have that low cost of capital. This is precisely in line with the game plan. And it's not a new strategy. It's worked time and time again over the four decades that I've been in the mining business. Darren, just this week, and I think Rick alluded to this earlier, you uh, and Caliber Mining announced some really big news that kind of uh, really puts a new light on everything we've been talking about with the acquisition of Fiore Gold, gold producer in Nevada. Could you talk to us about why this is such a big deal in, in the industry and why it's especially such a big deal for Caliber Mining? Yeah, it's probably uh, more prudent for me to talk about why it's a big deal for us. I think that uh, you know, Mr. Rule can probably provide more context as an industry. But, you know, for Caliber, you know, Fiori offers production and diversification into Nevada, a tier one mining jurisdiction, a very attractive entry point into North America and a platform from which to grow. In addition to the established production at PAN, we'll also obtain an attractive development project in Gold Rock that has the potential to more than double Nevada gold production to 100,000 ounces a year. The team at Fiori has done a commendable job in establishing PAN as a reliable producer, generating operating cash flow, which they successfully reinvested into the business. Now, this is where the opportunity presents. PAN, as a 40,000 ounce producer, has been able to sustain the operations but can't generate the levels of cash required to grow and realize the full potential of the consolidated Nevada assets. You know, we see excellent potential for resource and reserve expansion at PAN and Gold Rock and will accelerate exploration programs at both projects and can currently progress the pre-feasibility at Gold Rock. Additionally, encompassing PAN and Gold Rock is a very prospective and underexplored 222 kilometer square land package in a very prospective part of Nevada. So given the strong financial resources of the company, Caliber will have the ability to fully fund the development pipeline, including Gold Rock, Eastern Barossia and Nevada, and expand exploration efforts to encompass Nevada, which will result in significant value creation for the benefit of both our shareholders. Rick, when you hear that, is this a big step or just an incremental, something you were expecting all along? Or is this like a big big uh, bombshell from your standpoint as an analyst looking at Caliber Mining, which had previously had operations primarily not focused in, in Nevada or in the U.S.? I would describe it as a validation uh, of the fact that they actually intend to abide by <laughs> their operating plan, <laughs> which isn't always common. Uh, and I, I think it's a continuation of what they did in Nicaragua. Uh, you know, they took uh, an asset that they felt could make perform better. They made it perform better. Uh, they've come to a new, new jurisdiction with a proven operating team. So they don't have to tax. In other words, they don't have to steal from their Nicaraguan operating team to operate in Nevada. Uh, importantly, what they did, though, uh, is a bit like alchemy. Uh, a, a guy like me isn't going to care much about a 40,000 ounce mine. Uh, I, I'm not going to care much about a mine with gross sales below $150 million a year. But if you append that into a larger hole and you show me and you show me a way that you can fund the growth to get it to a 100,000 ounce producer, this is a circumstance where two plus two equals six and a half or seven. Uh, there are a lot of investors like me who don't have any particular interest in small mines unless they're operated by uh, companies who can first of all operate smaller mines uh, and, and grow the small mines but make them part of a larger whole. So this is a circumstance where there was an asset which was for me uninvestable uh, Fiore, uh, and turn it into something that's highly accretive. It, there's a lot of people out there who say that they're going to bootstrap and they're going to take an operation from 40,000 ounces to 100,000 ounces. But the truth is that they don't have uh, either necessarily the operating skill sets uh, or the financial tools to get it done. In this circumstance, you are merging that asset into a company that's already done it before. That helps. Uh, and clearly has both the cash and the free cash flow to get it done. 
So it's a it's a circumstance where although acquiring 40,000 ounces doesn't make a big difference, it's validation of a business plan that's already proven and already being accomplished by the existing team. Darren, we got wanted to circle back with you because Rick had mentioned earlier, uh, again, something that you've mentioned about no debt. He mentioned it again. Uh, 96 million in cash, I think, is what's projected once you close the Fiore deal and producing at that point up to 245,000 ounces a year. So looking like a strong and profitable company with strong cash flows, but where will you, as Rick says, you know, this is validating what your plan was before, where do you see in the future and allocating capital in the future and why? And will you be uh, bringing out any more exploration potential that you were uh, known for in the past? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, our strategy will remain the same and that's to reinvest in the draw bit. Um, you know, we'll be able to self-fund significant levels of exploration in Nicaragua. And if you look at where our focus has been thus far in Nicaragua, it's really about establishing a basis from which to build. Um, you know, we could have gone much further afield from a generative exploration perspective and shown all this wonderful uh, additions in inferred resources, but we would have been doing it up a pretty thin production base. You know, what we've been able to establish with these assets in the last two years is a cogent plan for the next five, which is underpinned by reserves. So we have a level of confidence and that kind of, in my mind, earned the right to be able to now look further afield in that generative exploration, which, you know, given the given the fact that these assets have been in, in operations for decades and combined have produced in excess of five million equity ounces, is, is that, you know, there's a lot of runway in front of these assets. Interestingly enough, from an exploration perspective as well, most everything that has been developed in Nicaragua has been developed because it outcropped its surface. So, you know, there's no reason that these, you know, attractive bonanza grade, low sulfidization epithermal deposits should outcrop its surface. So as we bring kind of what I'll call modern exploration methods into Nicaragua, including some geophysics, you know, I think we'll be able to uncover the deposits which are at cover. So that'll be a big focus. Um, and again, it, it'll, it'll, our, our programs will morph in Nicaragua from continued focus on, on replacing reserves and resources but more importantly, growing the resource from discovery. In in Nevada, it'll be a similar process, right? Is is that the the uh, the Fury team have done a great job at establishing Pavon as a reliable producer, and again, relatively low grade, relatively thin margins. But you know they've established a really good capital discipline. So leveraging off that capability and operating capacity within the business, us investing and understanding what the full potential of Pan can be by by allocating a required level of exploration dollars will allow us to be able to establish appropriate scope and scale. Um, so no, I, I think that's where our focus will be is is in the drill bit, growing it, and we can do it all organically. So we've established the base in Nicaragua, which will fund everything we want to do elsewhere. Um, so organically, that'll be the focus. And, you know, again, the consensus analysis for the next three, sorry, two years is in that 245,000 ounces a year. But what I'd look at, I'd look at the two years, two to three years from this point, and, you know, it's reasonable to expect that, you know, Nevada will be 100,000 ounces a year, Nicaragua will be 250,000 ounces a year, so organically you're looking at 350,000 ounces a year of consolidated production between these assets, as we have some exploration success in, in Nicaragua and better utilize the mill capacity. And, you know, one thing I will highlight you look this year in Nicaragua, for example, we're 170 to 180,000 ounces of what we've got for the full year. Average grade process is about 3.3 grams per ton. Average reserve grade is four and a half. So, you know, as we progress through the sequence and we see the increased grade that comes from reserve, we'll see a, a 30 to 40 percent kick in production just as a function of grade. Right. We'll obviously, you know, have a very positive impact on free cash flow, which will then allow us to continue to look at a, at a consolidating role, to look at what other, what other opportunities exist. With a footprint in Nevada, it gives us that opportunity to look at things in Nevada and North America. Um, so yeah, we'll be, continue to be patient, diligent investors and be opportunistic when the right deal presents. And I think that's a little bit what differentiates us. You know, you know, we're not, we're in a hurry to do things, but we're not impatient, right? So we will take the time and we will invest wisely as we look at what external opportunities can present. 
But given the fact that we can generate significant levels of cash organically and grow the business, is, is that we don't have that need to. It's kind of like borrowing money, right? You don't want to borrow money when you have to. You want to have that capacity. So I think we're in a similar position from a growth perspective. A statement you just made reminded me of a director that I used to work for who said there's a difference between go fast and go reckless. It sounds like you've got a way of, of moving efe- effectively and efficiently forward, you know, but not uh, doing it in a pace that isn't isn't prudent. Uh, Rick, I wanted to give you a chance to weigh in. If we could turn the, the, the this around kind of, kind of a completely different direction. And we've been focusing on the company, their prospects, their strategy. Their, okay, not every company is the right in, uh, right for every investor. So you work as kind of a matchmaker quite often in the past between natural resource investors and finding the right companies for them to consider. If you think of it in terms of for what kind of investors, given the size, the growth potential, the risk profile, that sort of thing, what what class of investors or what category of investors or what, what uh, needs of investors, if you could talk to us about the ideal investor for whom you think that they should seriously take a look at Caliber? I, I think the first thing is to <laughs> do some wordsmithing. Uh, I define an investor as somebody who is willing to take moderate risk for a probable return on capital employed. I think a speculator is someone who is willing to take greater risk, but uh, with a lower probability, that is, with the possibility of ex, uh, very sizable returns on capital employed. I started my career as a speculator. Now I'm both a speculator and an investor, but I want to say that all the money now, I now invest sensibly, I made speculating somewhat less sensibly. I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, at this stage, caliber is still a speculation. It's not a penny dreadful. Uh, obviously, having that treasury, that balance sheet, and that ca- that free cash flow gives them a lot of tools. But an investor in caliber needs to be willing to take some risk. Multi-jurisdictional risk, which is to say you're operating both in Nevada and in Nicaragua. The perception risk around Nicaragua, by the way, I've done business in Nicaragua now for two decades, uh, and I've been treated extraordinarily well there. Uh, I think an investor needs to be patient. And in, in particular, an investor needs to be process oriented. An investor needs to look at Caliber and say, OK, they have succeeded in developing the hub and spoke model in Nicaragua. The consequence of having that producing infrastructure means that if they make a new discovery there that wouldn't be economic on a standalone basis, given that the infrastructure is already established, it can be highly economic. In other words, they have a durable competitive advantage in Nicaragua relative to other companies because of their producing base. They've now established the ability to have that advantage again in Nevada, which is to say a standalone discovery without access to their uh, milling and processing uh, uh, activity in Nevada might not be economic. But given the fact that they don't have to rebuild a mill Uh, or something like that. They don't have to go from scratch, means that they have a durable competitive advantage in the district over anybody else. Secondly, they've shown now twice that, uh, or at least one and a half times, uh, that they can grow by acquisition, that they can find circumstances where they leverage their financial and operating activities so that they can pay a fair price for an asset but as a consequence of their skill sets, almost immediately increase at least the perceived value and ultimately the real value of that asset. Uh, By the way, speculators who aren't patient, there's a word to describe them, it's loser. Uh, The whole speculative class that believes that they're due a triple before the long weekend uh, are people that I've observed for 45 years. And so people that don't have rational expectations, people who don't understand why they're speculating, and people who don't understand that they have to give their money the benefit of time are people that shouldn't be speculating. So in that circumstance, uh, every speculator should be a patient speculator, or else he and she are almost certain to become losers. I'd like to turn the tables one more time here, and I've been asking the questions. Rick, I'd like to give you a free shot at any question you want to ask Darren for the, on the behalf of our audience. If you could put yourself in the position, as I try to, of what do I think um, would be a question that would tease out uh, some information that, that the audience would find most useful. Go ahead and take a crack at it. I think I have three questions. 
um, I'll, I'll confine myself to three. I have many. I'm curious. Uh, the first question would have to do with the exploration tools that you think might be appropriate in Nicaragua and Nevada. What might you be able to try that other people haven't been able to try? What do you think will work well? You talked about covered deposits. Uh, what is it that investors might expect uh, in terms of the exploration methodology that you would employ in both locations? Rick, and the first question there is, and I'll focus more so on Nicaragua, is, is that you know we've got planned commence in uh, commissioning late this quarter and uh, execute in Q1 of next year, about seven to 8,000 line kilometers of geophysics, um, helicopter airborne geophysics, which allow us to be able to identify deposits of cover. You know, we continue with our, our uh, trace elements, uh, geochemical, the, the conventional kind of surface-based exploration or, sorry, you know, prospect generating uh, programs in Nicaragua as well. And we've got a lineup of, of targets to drill on our on our concessions. And we just recently increased our concessions to about 2,000 square kilometres in Nicaragua. So we're a significant landholder with, you know, plenty of opportunities and plenty of high prospect targets that have been validated by the ge by ge by not by geophysics but by you know early stage and doing the trenching and mapping, we just haven't had an opportunity to drill it. Um, at in Nevada, I mean, I think the the folks at, at Fiori have done the same. They have excellent targets on the book. They just haven't had the ability to be able to drill them. So I think that you know we'll continue to look at. And I'm not the exploration expert, but in terms of the method of identifying the new targets, but the targets that are on the books, I think are going to take us potentially a couple of years to just understand what's there already as we come in with 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 uh, the funds to be able to do the drilling. So um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question in terms of the technical aspects, but uh, and partly because I'm not going to try and talk about something that I'm not truly a subject matter expert in. Well, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that there's enough low-hanging fruit or potential low-hanging fruit from historical efforts that you don't have to bother yourself for a couple of years with advanced technology in either location. Is that an accurate summation? I, I think you'd run both, though. It's in parallel. I don't think they necessarily run sequentially. They run concurrently. I think that okay. you know, we have lots of opportunities to look at in the short term, which we will do. And at the same time, we'll look at more of the generative true prospect generation concurrently so that you know, what we want to do is ensure that we've got a pipeline that's that's overflowing in terms of opportunities in which we can pick and choose from as we progress forth. Because, you know, obviously even the high, the, the low hanging fruit, as it were, you know, a number of those won't prove out, but a number of them will, right? So we want to make sure that our pipeline is, is overflowing with opportunity. And I think that at, to now it has been, but I think that going forward, I think that you will see an increased focus in the generative space. As I mentioned in uh, earlier, you know, a lot of our focus over the last 12, 18 months from an exploration perspective has been, you know, has been improving confidence in. Now we've got to get more generative. We have targets and we will add more pro targets to that portfolio as we go forward. The second question is a very different type of question. Um, you've done two uh, how would you say, uh, buy and build tests now. Uh, in terms of further acquisitions, what would be the defining characteristics of potential targets? What is it, what sort of opportunity you're looking for and how geographically or geologically constrained would you be? Yeah, interesting question. And I guess is that, you know, there's, we're not too myopically focused in terms of a specific region, but, you know, there are some areas in the world which you would try and, stay away from. But, you know, if you look at where our geographic presence is, you know, the Americas make good sense to us, right? So, you know, given our Nicaraguan presence and our soon-to-be Nevadan presence, you know, I think the Americas is a good is a good place to be. Um, in terms of what would we like to do? You know, we, we started out with, you know, production with growth. We've done that. Now, our second step is more production with probably arguably even increased growth. So as we look at where that positions us in that 350,000 ounce of producer in a couple of years time, we can start to anticipate, well, you know, maybe it's time for us to look at a development stage property as well, right? If there's something that makes sense 
and is accretive too, then that could be a, a logical step. Or again, it could be adding another production with growth opportunity. So I think that you know we're we're kind of flexible in in, in exactly what we want to do, but we know where we want to get to, and that's that you know multi jurisdictional, multi asset quality mid tier producer targeting five hundred thousand ounces a year. And I think that you know some people get a little too definitive in terms of saying well it has to be this way. And I think when they do that they get too blink of their approach. You know, we're open to consider anything that could create shareholder value because ultimately we're a financial instrument that is looking to return value to our shareholders and we're going to do that through the exploitation of gold. That's what we're about. We're not here to be a gold producer. The gold producer is a, is, is a means to an end to create shareholder value. Uh, finally, in terms of the amalgamation strategy, well, mining business in general, they're capital intensive businesses. So cost of capital is a definable business advantage. Given that that's your orientation, uh, might we be looking forward to in the next little while a New York Stock Exchange listing and perhaps an at the market facility, which would seem to be the lowest cost of capital uh, financing mechanism available on the planet today? Yeah, in terms of the uh, New York listing, it's is that no, it's it's something that obviously, with as we get into uh, uh, the Nevada and assets, I think that that would be a logical step in our development going forward. Um, you know, again, we've we've considered the idea, but again, as a Nicaraguan focused producer, it wasn't opportunistic. But I think as we've now expanded and grown the business, I think that that very much would be an opportunity. Um, you know, again, primarily. Our, our focus is to continue strengthening our balance sheet by adding cash. But I think that as we look at what opportunities could present, yeah, looking at uh, at how we could position ourselves with that available credit would be a, a logical next step as well. Thank you, Rick and Darren. Darren, if people want to find out more about Caliber Mining Corp, where do you recommend that they go? Yeah, a, a first stop would obviously be the website. Um, so calibermining.com and uh, feel free to reach out to myself and information's on the uh, on the uh, on the website and uh, of course of our releases have contact information for Ryan as well so you know, we're uh, we're available to uh, talk to anyone at any time and uh, you know we enjoy talking to people and and, it's, and talking about our product but also in that we like to uh, it's a two-way street so we like to hear what what people have to offer to us as well so you know we're uh, we're very, uh, very amenable to stealing with pride. So if anyone's got any ideas on things to be done or opportunities we can do better, we're, uh, we're willing to listen. So I appreciate it. Yeah, and part of that product is the result of this process that uh, Rick has been uh, pointing out, and we are appreciative of that description as well. It really helps us to see behind the, the curtain. Uh, Rick, before we let anybody go, we want to make sure we give you a chance to renew your offer to rank people's investment portfolios. Thank you for that. Uh, people who have enjoyed this interview and the other interviews we've done together and care about my opinion about resource investing can personalize it. Specifically, anybody that goes to a website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, can enter their natural resource portfolio. Please, no crypto. Please, no tech. Please, no pot stocks. Uh, I will rate your portfolio 1 to 10, uh, each company, 1 being best, 10 being worst. I'll add individual comments if I think my comments might have that add value. And for those who care about visual aids, if somebody mentions charts in the question section, I will include a 60-year copy of the Barron's Gold Mining Index, which is the best gold equity index I'm aware of, and a 100-year commodity chart, which shows in visual form just how cheap a variety of industrial commodities are relative to other asset classes in the economy going back 100 years. Once again, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. Well, both of you gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. Rick, again, it's always a pleasure and our audiences look forward to learning as I do from the way that you think about these things, the way that you ask about them and the thought process. You mentioned process. You're talking about industrial processes. <laughs> That's really, we're looking at your, it's your uh, value analytical process we're trying to learn by from your example and also darren just thank you for joining us this first time to let us know more from an operations standpoint and a strategy standpoint than we knew before about caliber mining so both you guys thanks for joining us on liberty and finance thank you Justin. appreciate it. thank you very much take care gents <laughs>